recording just now. Um, thank you all for attending and welcome everyone to the second lecture in our four part lecture series co sponsored by the Idaho Clinicians for Climate and Health and the St. Luke's Sustainability Program. I want to thank uh, Stephanie Wicks, my partner in everything sustainability, and Michael Hobson from Public Relations and Communications at St. Luke's, who has helped us make this work. Um, we're going to have two dynamic speakers today talking about wildfire smoke and its impacts on human health. Uh, first up will be Dr. Luke Montrose, um, who is uh, now a professor at Colorado State University, and will be talking more about the science around wildfires and uh, how wildfire smoke impacts human health. And then Dr. Cecilia Sorensen from Columbia University will be speaking about uh, more specifically the human health impacts of wildfire smoke. Um, so first up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Luke Montrose. Luke is an environmental toxicologist with research interests in public health, epigenetics, and chronic illness, particularly as it relates to vulnerable and understudied populations. He is currently working as an assistant professor in environmental and radiological health sciences at Colorado State University. Dr. Montrose positions himself to work collaboratively across the campus and across the West to work with relevant stakeholders, including faculty, state, and local officials, and community partners. The Montrose Lab leverages its expertise in epigenetics, community research, and exposure assessment to better understand molecular basis of toxicant-induced disease risk throughout the life course. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Luke Montrose. All right, hello everyone. Uh, let me get my screen shared. We seeing that okay? Yes, indeed. All right. Uh, well, thank you for that really great introduction. And thank you all so much for your participation in this great event. Um, I very recently made the transition to uh, Colorado State and I'm actually still uh, in the middle of that transition, uh, actually onboarding uh, remotely. Uh, I'm currently in uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon. And uh, timely for this talk, uh, I actually just last night uh, experienced some uh, impacts from wildfires and wildfire smoke uh, as there was a wildfire just kind of down the road here that was started by someone who threw a, a, a lit cigarette uh, out the window. So um, anyways, uh, just to kind of let you guys know where I'm transitioning from, i uh, for the last three and a half years, I uh, was a professor at Boise State University, and that's kind of where some of the research that you'll see today is going to come from. Uh, so this is uh, kind of my thank you slide, sometimes shown at the end, but I wanted to do it uh, at the beginning today and kind of just show you that there's a dynamic group of uh, folks who contribute to this research, uh, certainly not just me, um, partners at uh, regional institutions like the University of Montana, Boise State, uh, uh, industrial hygienists like Mark Cooper shown there, and then a, a, a vast array of, of students um, who support this work shown there on the right. And I'll highlight the students throughout today's talk uh, where their work is pertinent. Um, so the overarching goal of my lab is to develop partnerships um, uh, in the community and specific to this research uh, with long-term care uh, uh, facilities. And this work you'll see is uh, relating to monitoring uh, air quality to enhance those uh, long-term care facilities and ultimately to reduce the risk for smoke-induced uh, negative effects. Um, my lab takes a cell to society approach uh, to wildfire smoke uh, adverse effects. And we do work in biomarkers and mechanisms of smoke effects indoor air quality assessment and communication, and then actually the dissemination uh, and creative advancement of this work. Um, and so today's work will focus mostly there in the middle portion of this slide uh, with the assessment and communication. Let's kind of frame the problem here uh, quickly. Uh, we all, I think, recognize wildfire, wildfires and wildfire smoke are a problem, uh, and that's why we're here today. Uh, but act, the wildfire activity is increasing. Um, and uh, we also can see that uh, some of the most active fire years where uh, if we look at just acres burned, um, we see that many of these uh, are in the last uh, uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, 
Um, so some of the largest fires since 1960 uh, are in the recent past. Uh, and where there's fire, there's smoke. And what we see across the United States is actually an, uh, an improvement in air quality. Uh, and so anywhere where you see blue and purple, air quality is improving. Green uh, is essentially a wash, uh, not really getting better or worse. And anywhere where you see red or orange, uh, this is getting, uh, air quality is getting worse. And um, unfortunately, the, the Northwest is getting hit pretty hard and the air quality is getting worse primarily due to wildfires. Um, and uh, what we see in the West is that the amount of air pollution uh, coming from wildfire generated sources is uh, increasing in its uh, overall distribution. So if we look at all sources of air pollution, uh, wildfire smoke is taking uh, a larger portion of that each year. So why are we so worried about smoke? What's in the smoke? Uh, it's a complex mixture, uh, depends on what, what is burning and, and when and, temp and things like temperature. Uh, but in general, we see some of the same uh, uh, players, things like carbon monoxide, VOCs, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, nitric oxides, hydrocarbons. But we, we typically uh, uh, look for particulate matter as a, a proxy measurement for wildfire smoke. And that's because particulate matter, uh, we, we look at that because it's a, a very small uh, part, uh, very uh, size wise, it's small, it can get very deep into the lungs, it can cause issues with um, oxygen exchange. So we need oxygen to survive. Oxygen is passed across the alveolar uh, space uh, into the blood. And if we have particulate matter in this space, that can be a problem for that oxygen exchange. Um, the EPA uh, makes particulate matter, uh, uh, takes it very seriously and has included it as one of its six criteria pollutants. Um, and it has a standard for the outdoor environment of 35 micrograms per meter cubed. Um, and if you've not heard this number before, you've probably seen it and you've seen it uh, shown as a color. 35 micrograms per meter cubed is the cutoff for when it becomes unhealthy for sensitive groups outside. So if you've looked at the AQI category, you've seen that shift from yellow to orange, it's shifting at that 35 micrograms per meter cube. And that number is going to be important uh, for my presentation today. Why are, we, uh, in, why are we concerned with exposure? Well, these are the types of things that we can see in the community. If we see a change in uh, air quality, we see a change in things like hospital admission rates, uh, bronchitis, uh, longer term issues like cardiovascular disease, stroke, and even cancer. Um, and it's particularly important uh, that we are uh, looking for these uh, exposure concerns in folks like the old and those with comorbidities. Again, important for my talk today as we're going to be looking at the long-term care community. So I kind of wanted to show you what's been done in the field uh, and how my study is going to be contextualized. We're going to talk about an air monitoring project that I did in the long-term care community, and I'm not the first person to do this. Um, there's, I'm showing you here a couple different studies where folks have gone into long-term care or into hospital settings, looked at uh, um, air pollution uh, either by some type of regulatory monitor or low-cost sensor, um, and they've done sort of short stints uh, where they go in, they look for a couple days, maybe they come back, they look for a couple days, but they're, they're, these weren't really longitudinal or long-term studies. And generally what they found was when the outdoor air quality became poor, the indoor air quality became poor to some extent. Um, the study on the right is actually showing you across different floors in a hospital. Um, and so you can see at the top there, uh, outside, when the outside air became poor, uh, it, it trended uh, uh, in a way where we could see it becoming poor inside, but it really depended on where you were inside the facility. And that's very interesting, but again, this study only occurred uh, over just a short period of time. Um, and so how that's gonna be different uh, from, from my study is, you know, we're gonna do this over a year. Um, before we launched our year long study in a, skilled, in a skilled nursing facility environment, we wanted to understand uh, the monitors that we were using. And so we actually did a laboratory study where we looked at uh, several different low cost monitors. Um, we actually exposed them in uh, this 
uh, lab experimental chamber uh, where we burned a fire in a wood stove, we piped that smoke in and we exposed these monitors. Um, and what the students who worked on this found was that the low cost monitors actually did a relatively good job compared to more expensive laboratory grade equipment. Um, and we wanted to see uh, how this equipment performed in the outdoor environment. So we, um, we worked with the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality to set up our $200 monitor next to a $20,000 uh, Department of Environmental Quality monitor. Um, and what we found was that there was really good correlation between this $200 monitor and the $20,000 monitor shown here uh, in the bottom. Um, and so the student who did this work uh, presented this poster at one of our smoke uh, symposium conferences. So we felt now that we had a good handle on this equipment, we could launch this, uh, this project. We recruited four skilled nursing facilities across Idaho, uh, and we decided that we would put one monitor inside the facility, uh, typically in the nurse's station, uh, where we had good uh, air mixture, uh, where it was a uh, far enough away from outdoor sources or or at least far enough away from windows and doors and then not next to a uh, indoor source like the the kitchen and then we had an outdoor monitor that was placed away from cars and vehicle traffic where we tried to put it in like a recreational area we had three different air sheds that were represented sort of the northern part of idaho southwestern and southeastern and these facilities ranged in age they also ranged in approximate square footage um, and how the facility was used. So you can see that one 15,000 square foot building had 15 beds, whereas the other one uh, might have had as the other one could have had as many as 40. Um, all of these facilities were running MERV 13s. And this is prior to uh, so MERV 13 being a very high quality uh, air filtration uh, filter in their HVAC system. And this was even prior to uh, COVID occurring. So this was in January of 2020 that we started this study. Um, this just gives you a snapshot of, of how we did over the, the year-long period. We were able to capture approximately 300 days of sampling on average across those four facilities. Uh, reasons for missing data had to do with things like uh, power or Wi-Fi uh, outage. Sometimes uh, a nurse would uh, need to plug her cell phone in uh, instead of uh, uh, my unit. So sometimes my unit would get unplugged and we'd have to get that back uh, in, in running order. Um, so this is sort of the, the, the nuts and bolts of the entire study. Let me orient you. This is showing four facilities, uh, F1, F2, F3, F4, across an entire year, January 1 through uh, December 1, there on the bottom of each of these graphs. And then on the y-axis is PM 2.5. That's that um, size fraction that can get deep into the lungs. And it's shown here in micrograms per meter cubed. And we'll remember back to one of those earlier slides where I said that uh, 35 micrograms per meter cubed is an important number to stay below. Um, that's the National Ambient Air Quality Standard for 24 hours. That's the dotted line, uh, the, uh, the sort of higher dotted line. The lower dotted line is the annual standard of 12. We can see that the red, which is um, the indoor, uh, and the blue, which is the outdoor, uh, are shown here on all four graphs. And what we would hope is that uh, red would be lower than, than blue. That means that it's better to be inside than outside. Um, and where we see these blue spikes are primarily in that area from August to about October, uh, which is the wildfire season. We don't see very many spikes outside of that. We can also see that there's a good separation, for example, in facility one, we see that like uh, on August 26th, uh, which if you can see my cursor is about right here, we see this giant outdoor spike and we see that there's separation between the blue and the red, which means that facility is able to clean that air to some extent. There's a similar spike here, maybe slightly lower um, than the other spike uh, at 70, and this one is maybe around 80 but we see that the red is nearly as high as the blue. So what that tells us is facility two is having a harder time cleaning that air. And it's, it's uh, really not that much more safe to be inside than it is uh, to be outside during that event. And I've sort of uh, uh, summarized some of our uh, takeaways from that um, over here on the right. So here is that same data sort of in tabular form. And what we've done is try to calculate what we call an infiltration efficiency. So infiltration efficiency uh, close to one um, is very bad. So we remember facility two was, was having a really hard time cleaning their air 
Um, and we were getting a lot of outdoor air coming into the facility and staying in that facility. And so the infiltration efficiency here is 0.76, very close to one, whereas facility three has an infiltration efficiency of 0.22. Now that's, facility three is a very interesting situation if we look, they had almost no spikes above the outdoor uh, standard, except for this one extremely major event where we see almost 300 micrograms per meter cubed. And we can actually see that the red, the indoor level was almost 200 micrograms per meter cubed. And this is a daily average. So at that facility, that facility spent nearly a day at 200 micrograms per meter cubed, which is uh, you know, a fold higher than, um, uh, than the outdoor standard. So the EPA says we should stay below 35 uh, this facility was above 200. This is uh, potentially concerning for those residents. So what do we take away from this 12 month long, uh, I believe one of the longest long-term care uh, indoor outdoor air quality assessments that have been done. Infiltration of particulate pollution happened at all four facilities. So regardless of where you were at in Idaho, this, this infiltration uh, was occurring. Uh, infiltration was greatest during the wildfire season, but it was variable across those four facilities. And so the, in parentheses here, I've put that it may be potentially modifiable because we would anticipate that if infiltration was going to um, be not modifiable, it would be the same across the four facilities. Because it wasn't, there may be things that one facility was doing well that the other facilities might be able to learn from put into place and then maybe be able to protect their residents um, uh, sort of additionally. Now we published this work uh, in Indoor Air, uh, a, a journal that um, I believe this is actually, we paid extra to kind of have this uh, open access. So anyone should be able to go on to PubMed or whatever your uh, journal search engine uh, of preference is and find this article. And so I've listed its title uh, right here and we published that earlier this year in June. Um, and there was a, a really fantastic student who uh, uh, worked on a poster for his uh, senior project uh, and I'm showing it here and just giving him some props for that. So we took this information and we asked, you know, what, what can we do with this? Uh, how do we help these different facilities with these potentially modifiable factors? Um, and, and so what we thought of was, what if we uh, went into these facilities and we helped uh, HVAC maintenance oper operators uh, with uh, some, some tips that might be able to help improve the indoor air quality. And so I wanted to kind of show you some of the things that we thought might be occurring. So some, some issues, some common issues might be things like uh, HVAC maintenance and operation issues. Like here uh, we see an, an illy fitted, uh, poorly fitted uh, air filter in this, uh, in this uh, system. Um, we also see that some facilities had cracks around windows. This can be another place for smoke to intrude. Um, we also know that there's lots of uh, things that where smoke can infiltrate through things like makeup air units or rooftop air units, uh, open doors or windows, um, attic spaces. And so we took all of this information and we generated a workshop. We presented that workshop to a group of maintenance workers in December. And the idea was that we would present this workshop and then uh, we would select some of those uh, participants and then kind of have an interview with them and see what they learned and maybe what they would take uh, into the next fire season that they might use to uh, better plan uh, and, and perhaps mitigate some of those um, exposures. Um, and so this is sort of the premise and the purpose and the description of how we did that maintenance workshop. Um, kind of draw your attention down here. We, we split this into three sections. I talked about smoke and health. We had an industrial hygienist uh, give a presentation and then we had someone who was very knowledgeable about eight, HVAC um, operation and maintenance talk as well. Um, we ended up having 24 people who attended and 20 took part in some polling questions, which we got some really interesting data from, uh, how long uh, they worked at that facility, whether or not they got any training outside of the facility where nearly almost all of them uh, learned about their job uh, uh, at their place of work, not from any type of outside schooling. <laughs> and whether or not they were confident uh, in their role as uh, HVAC maintenance and operation personnel. Um, we see that uh, many of them thought that they would uh, use this information to help prioritize indoor air quality uh, 
uh, during the wildfire season. And we asked them, you know, if they were prioritizing it, but they had barriers, what, what would cause a barrier uh, to implementation of some of their new knowledge? Uh, so things like money and time were obviously uh, noted here. Um, and then in the future, did they have any interest in creating and implementing a smoke management plan? And we were delighted to see that most of these folks uh, would. Um, and so we then later asked them in an interview where we interviewed about four skilled nursing facility maintenance personnel, um, what did they take away from that, that meeting, that workshop, and what would they put into place? Um, and just to highlight some of these folks and um, what they said, um, I, I really like this quote, I definitely had an enhanced perspective of how the indoor air quality was different and sometimes even worse than the outdoor air quality. And the sense that I felt like I had a bit more protection indoors versus outdoors, but came to realize that I needed to enhance the kind of filtration uh, in order to protect the residents. So we really saw those folks engaging in the material and, uh, and taking away information that we thought uh, would help uh, protect their facilities. Um, but how to actually implement a smoke management plan was one uh, problem that we sort of took away from that workshop. Um, and so we had a student who um, actually generated some questions uh, and uh, for these interviews and actually helped me design uh, a on-site uh, workshop where we went to one facility and we actually tried to implement a smoke preparedness planning, uh, smoke preparedness plan. So we did a site visit, we did a building tour, we drafted and discussed the plan, we identified pros and cons of that planning process, and we just determined the cost and the feasibility of actually implementing that across multiple facilities underneath this, um, this one facility's umbrella. So it was one facility uh, that was under a corporation and they had multiple facilities that this could potentially be scaled to. Um, and so we took some surveys of the folks who participated in that and um, we're currently uh, sort of curating those materials with the goal of um, expanding this out to a number of other facilities across Idaho. Um, one thing that we also put into place uh, was at one facility, we're currently working uh, with these low cost monitors to take that raw data and use a data consultant to generate uh, an on-site dashboard, which we think might help those facility coordinators uh, with uh, the day-to-day -day, um, implementation of uh, mitigating factors. So if your air quality is bad inside and you're putting things into place, is that having an effect on that air quality? They would need to have that data real time for them to be able to, um, for them to be able to do that type of a process. So we're trying to work through the logistics of actually giving them an on-site dashboard. Um, one other summer project uh, from one of my students that I wanted to show you um, that sort of uh, is an expansion of this work is trying to understand um, across the Mountain West, where is, where is data currently being generated and where is it not being generated? So this is a map uh, across uh, the Mountain West where each of the little uh, green dots is a, um, a Department of Environmental Qu Quality Monitor. Uh, and these red uh, sort of tags are uh, skilled nursing facilities that are outside of a 50 mile radius. So essentially we're questioning whether or not those facilities would have good air quality data because of how far away they are from their closest Department of Environmental Quality Monitor. Um, and what we see is uh, across uh, the Mountain West, some states fare better than others with the number or the, the, the distance. So the average distance of a facility to its Department of Environmental Quality, for example, in the state of New Mexico is 56 miles as compared to, for example, Idaho, which we were uh, surprised to find was uh, the average was only 3.6 miles. So this um, is something that we think uh, Department of Environmental Quality uh, folks uh, can use to perhaps plan uh, the, the deployment of their monitors in the future. And my last slide uh, here is just showing you uh, how we hope to disseminate some of this information and engage uh, partners across the Mountain West. Starting in 2020, we began this Rocky Mountain Wildfire Smoke Symposium, um, and it's been a huge success over the last couple of years. Um, this year's meeting is November 14th, and we will be addressing community resilience. Um, and so the the agenda as of right now is uh, the morning session will be community engagement and strategies for communication. 
We'll have a networking lunch, some student lightning talks, and in the afternoon, we'll talk about developing sustainable programs and how we can engage uh, our policymakers in helping to fund uh, some of these projects. So with that, I'm, I'm just going to thank you again for your time and participation in this event, and I'd be happy to take uh, a question now, or if we're going to hold questions, uh, happy to take those questions ap after the next talk. Well, thank you so much, Luke. That was spectacular. Um, we will do general questions at the end. I'm just going to throw a question to Luke while we're getting uh, Cecilia's talk lined up. Um, I just want to give a quick plug for the Rocky Mountain uh, Wildfire Smoke Symposium I attended last year, and it was really outstanding. Just a broad group of people working on wildfire smoke and health impacts um, and very educational and really helped me uh, kind of learn more about the issue and get more engaged. Um, Luke, do you foresee any community wide or municipality level uh, technology or interventions uh, to help combat community based air quality degradation from wildfire smoke? So this is a great question, and I think I'll answer it um, two ways. Uh, I've seen where a single person becomes the spearhead of a, a community uh, approach to um, wildfire smoke-related issues. And this is in Montana, and there's a really awesome uh, sort of uh, champion for wildfire smoke and health mitigation there called Sarah, her name is Sarah Cofield. Um, and the problem with that, the problem with Montana's approach to this is there's only one Sarah Cofield. And when she retires, you know, what happens to that program? I'm, I, I think she's doing great work there, but she is essentially the spearhead. And when that program, that program may live and die uh, by Sarah Cofield. And so um, I think we need to think about how we fund and make these programs sustainable and having one champion probably is not a great approach to that even with all the great work that, um, that Sarah does. The second program that I would highlight is uh, the D Denver program called Love My Air, which is a school-based program that's quickly expanding to other, uh, um, uh, I guess, um, types of uh, populations outside of just schools. Um, but that program, I think, is more sustainable. Um, it started off with a, a grant, but has found other uh, ways of funding itself. Um, and it's not just one person, it's an entire system. And so actually that entire group that started that program just sort of rolled off and they're rolling new people on. And I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see whether or not that Love My Air program uh, remains after we see this changing of the guard. And I think that'll give us a good idea of a template for how to make these programs sustainable. So those are two programs that I think are doing really great jobs, but sort of have two different approaches. And the, the good news for us in the Treasure Valley is I know that the Boise School District Sustainability Program has coordinated some efforts with that Love My Air program um, and have done some of their own studies looking at purple air monitors, indoor uh, air quality at uh, schools throughout the school district. Um, so I know the Boise School District is making this a focus for our kids. So well done to them. Okay, thank you so much, Luke. I'm gonna to transition to Cecilia. So Dr. Sorensen is the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education at Columbia University. She is an emergency medicine physician and an investigator in the area of climate change and health. Translating research into policy, clinical action and education in order to build resilience in vulnerable communities is the focus of her endeavors. Her recent work has spanned domestic and international emergent health issues related to climate change, heat stress and health, worker health in Guatemala, wildfires and healthcare utilization in the United States, the emergence of Zika in Ecuador following earthquakes in 2016, climate change and women's health in India and mortality following Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. She was the author of the US Fourth National Climate Assessment and as a technical advisor for the Lancet Climate and Health US Policy Brief. She's a member of the Colorado Consortium for Climate Change and a scientific advisor for the Citizens Climate Lobby and also the course director for the nation's first medical school course on climate change and human health. She co-directs the National Climate Health Fellowship Program at the University of Colorado, uh, which is a post-residency training program for physicians. So any docs out there that are interested in uh, learning more about how they can be uh, a climate champion like Cecilia should definitely take a look at their website uh, at CU Anschutz. So uh, everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sorensen and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. And Luke, really um, an honor to follow you. I learned actually so much from your talk. And uh, thank you so much. Um, I think, you know, I, 
the most important thing that I do on a daily basis is that I'm an emergency medicine doctor. And so I'm going to try to give my perspective from how I see wildfires really impacting human health, impacting the provision of health services, and really our day-to-day -day work that we do in health systems. So um, this is not me in the picture. This is a random picture I pulled off Google, but just to kind of set the scene. So uh, the past two years, I was working in Colorado in Northern Colorado before I went to Columbia. And it was one of the most active wildfire seasons um, that we've seen in the past decade. And it was simultaneously coinciding with COVID-19. And so where we were in Northern Colorado, um, we had massive wildfires, which were about 50 miles away. Um, but you kind of, you know, you walk into the hospital, um, it reeks like wildfire smoke, right? Because there's not a good HVAC system. And we're having critical patients rolling in right and left with shortness of breath. We're like, okay, is it COVID? Are they um, getting affected by wildfire smoke? Is it both? I don't know. Long story short is they're super sick. They need to be intubated and we have no ICU beds, right? <laughs> so that's kind of like the, the, the perspective that I'm coming from with this is really seeing um, the collision of these syndemics where we see you know, COVID-19, we see these emerging infectious diseases coinciding with this increased exposure to wildfire smoke um, and how that's impacting how our ability to deliver care. So what I want to kind of do today is roll through a couple objectives. I want to talk about kind of the link between climate change and wildfires, look at recent trends and projections, which Luke kind of already did, so I'll breeze through that, and then really kind of focus on the current literature that we have that helps us understand what the health impacts are so that we can figure out how we can prepare from the perspective of clinicians and also from the perspective of health system administrators and operations. So there's been tons on wildfires in the news. Right now, uh, Europe is actually battling some of the worst wildfires they've ever seen. And this came after um, an unprecedented heat wave, which swept across Europe. Um, and so we're seeing you know, wildfires happening in places that we're not expecting them to see, that haven't really been exposed in the past. Um, and this is really you know, becoming a global trend um, over the past 10 years that is, is expected to increase. Um, looking at this map, we see that, you know, one in six Americans actually live in areas that have significant wildfire risk, meaning that these are areas that could burn. We don't know. They kind of have the right combination of, of drought and high temperatures, et cetera, et cetera, which could predispose them to wildfires. But one in six Americans actually is, is facing this possibility. Um, let me see if this video will play here. Yes. Okay. So, you know, we say one in six Americans could deal with wildfires, um, you know, in their communities. But if we look at this map, you know, it's not just being in a community where there's a wildfire, it's dealing with the impacts of the smoke. And so looking up here, this is actually a video from 2017, where we're seeing the smoke coming from the massive burning of wildfires in the Pacific Northwest. Um, of Canada and the US, but look where the smoke is going, right? It's not just staying there, it is traveling everywhere, right? So even if you're not one of those one in six Americans who could have a wildfire in their community, we are still going to be impacted by wildfires no matter where we are. Um, so just that's kind of the, the perspective I wanted to share here. I was in New York City uh, the summer before last, and we had one of the worst air quality days in the world, like worse than New Delhi. And that was as a result of wildfires, right? Um, and so these impacts are happening everywhere. Uh, as, uh, as Dr. Montrose shared with you, we're seeing an increase in the intensity as well as the acres burned and the frequency of wildfires. Um, you know, looking over the past 40 years, this is also correlating with an increase in average surface temperatures, right? And so although there's up and down kind of every year, um, in general, we're seeing more wildfires. They're bigger, they're more intense, and they're happening with a higher frequency. So kind of connecting that that link sort of logically between, you know, we've climate change, then we've wildfires. Well, how do we get there? And so what we're seeing with climate change is we're seeing uh, higher average surface temperatures, right? We're seeing um, higher heat waves, right, which kind of seek to, uh, serve to kind of, you know, fuel fires. We're seeing earlier snow melts. We're seeing longer summer dry seasons. We're seeing changes in precipitation. You know, we're, we're not having, you know, the monsoons, which are supposed to come every year. Um, and then we're ultimately seeing, you know, changes in soil moisture. And all these factors ultimately impact forest ecosystems. And so just as an example here, you know, we're looking at the U.S. and we're looking at 
you know, average, this is only average warming um, since pre-industrial times. And obviously, you know, we're heating up. And then if we superimpose this on, uh, you know, surface soil moisture, we see that many areas are drying out, right? So we have heat coupled with drought. And ultimately what happens there is that this affects forest ecosystems, right? So we know that trees and um, plant life, which is stressed, kind of becomes immunocompromised, like almost like a human does. And, and it can't fight off pests as well as it could before. And so we see the outbreak of, you know, bark beetles of all these other types of pathogens, which affect trees and kill trees. And we also see that, you know, these warmer winters are preventing um, the insect and the fungal die-offs, which usually happen when we get really cold winters, um, and that helps the trees, right? But we're not seeing those, those cold, cold winters, and so these pathogen populations are growing exponentially, and all of this affects forest ecosystems and really sets the stage, in addition to the high temperatures and drought, for there to be larger wildfires. And you might notice this in your backyard, right, where you're seeing, oh my gosh, there's, looking on this hillside, there's this huge area of trees, which is, looks completely dead, you know, what's going on? On there. Um, we've seen large forest die-offs happening throughout the western U.S., and this is all kind of kindling for the fire. Now, when it comes to, you know, looking at the climate attribution of wildfires, um, it's important to know that the relationship between, you know, climate and, and climate change and wildfires, it's not, it's not linear, right? And we can't say, you know, every wildfire is caused by climate change, right? You know, we run into a lot of trouble there. Um, but what we do know is that as the climate warms, multiple tipping points get reached in these ecosystem interactions. And what this study was looking at um, was that, was uh, you know showing what percentage of these large file wildfires in the West would have happened with climate change and without climate change. And what they concluded is that you know roughly fifty percent of these wildfires could be attributed to climate change. Right. So wildfires are not a new thing. There's always been fires, but we're seeing them at this at this higher rate, at this higher intensity and frequency, and and fifty percent of that is attributable to climate change. Um, this was a graph that uh, Dr. Montrose put up. I think it's really important, especially for this group here. Um, you know, as we, you know, get better policies and better regulations around tailpipe emissions and industrial emissions, um, we are seeing better air quality in many parts of the country. But what we're facing is this big upwind battle towards wildfire smoke um, and the particulate pollution that it causes. And so, um, again, this, this map is really important. You know, it's, it's in some ways easier to control tailpipe emissions than it is to prevent wildfires and stop them from burning. As we know, it is incredibly resource and um, resource intensive. So what we know um, is that the currently the global burden of disease um, estimated to be attributable to wildfires is roughly around um, 350,000 deaths. And this is just related to smoke exposure. But this is really old data. This data is about 10 years old. Um, and so likely, you know, as we're seeing more um, wildfires that are burning, we're going to be seeing a, a greater burden on, um, on premature uh, mortality. But in addition to wildfires causing a lot of um, morbidity and mortality, it's also incredibly costly. And so this was a study by Fan et al. in 2018, where they found that the economic value of the short-term premature deaths and hospital admissions costs between 11 and 420 billion annually, um, just dealing with all these increased hospital admissions and the health impacts resulting from, uh, from wildfire exposure. And so that's a, there's huge error bars there, but it's somewhere on the order of a lot of money, right? Um, you know, when it comes down to what the health impacts are, you know, we have to think about, you know, well, what is in wildfire smoke? And Dr. Montrose talked about this a little bit. You know, there's fine particulate matter, right? That's the stuff that we're able to track and monitor with um, the awesome monitors that, that were described. There's also polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. There's pesticides, there's herbicides, there's fire retardants, there's carbon monoxide. And if you think about it, there's basically anything that burns. And so depending on where the fire is, you know, we could see burning of like those like plastic outdoor swimming pools, the burning of, you know, garages, all this stuff 
um, that's man-made that was never meant to be burned is suddenly getting burned and it's going into these huge <clears throat> smoke plumes. And so interestingly, there's been some emerging literature which is showing that actually exposure to wildfire smoke pollution is potentially worse than exposure to um, combustion products from fossil fuels like tailpipe emissions. And part of that might be driven by the fact that it's such a heterogeneous mixture of stuff that gets into wildfire smoke because it's coming into um, human settlements and causing burning of materials that aren't meant to be burned. So this is a very busy diagram, but I'll kind of walk through it a little bit here. And what we're looking at is sort of the pathophysiology of what happens once you start breathing in wildfire smoke. So if you track that particle, the smallest of the particles get inhaled very deeply into our alveoli in our lungs, where they cause oxidative stress, right? Um, it can damage pulmonary tissue, um, but it also, all that inflammation in the lungs creates systemic oxidative stress, right? And inflammation, and we know inflammation is, is bad. Secondly, we know that PM 2.5, which is that really, really small particulate matter, and other constituents of wildfire smoke can actually um, translocate over the alveolar capillary membrane and get into systemic circulation and go anywhere, right? So then we're seeing widespread endothelial cell damage, oxidative stress that can basically impact any organ in your body, right? Um, and so there's kind of the localized effects in the lungs, and then there's sort of the systemic cascade of inflammation that can happen. And so as a result of this, we see health impacts, right? Um, some of the best studies or most consistent studies are really looking at these respiratory health, health impacts. And so there's a lot of studies that we're looking at the association between wildfire smoke exposure and asthma, looking at um, exacerbations of COPD. And those results are pretty consistent across all uh, studies where we're looking at a population that's being exposed to wildfires, right? Anyone who's got underlying respiratory um, diseases is, is, is likely going to be affected. And we're going to be able to see that in the studies. Some of the best studies are coming right now out of really looking at the physiology and the pathophysiology of wildland firefighters, right? Because they are breathing the stuff in all day, every day. It's a huge occupational risk. And what's been found is that we see consistent declines in lung function. Um, a proxy for that we measure is FEV1 um, across work shifts, but also across seasons. And although in the off seasons, we see that there's some recovery, we're still lacking the long-term studies to really you know, look at how, how lung function declines after repetitive exposure to wildfire smoke. Um, and this is really important. I mean, with, with wildland firefighters, you know, we have this control population so we can see what their impact is and we know what they're exposed to roughly because we know where they've been sent to work, but we're lacking a lot of long-term studies looking at sort of community population level um, health impacts um, over, over decades, right? You know, if you live in an area of the West where every year you get exposed to one to two months of of wildfire smoke, you know, what does that do uh, after 10 years of that? We don't know the answer to that, but some of these early studies looking at occupational risks are hopefully going to get us there. Uh, the other thing that we look at when we are trying to understand health impacts is, uh, is cardiovascular and cerebrovascular outcomes. As you can kind of trace back, you know, if you're seeing system-wide oxidative stress and epithelial cell dysfunction, this is could potentially uh, potentiate, you know, strokes or myocardial infarctions or other types of acute um, cardiovascular and cerebrovascular outcomes. Now, what's interesting about this particular um, bucket of outcomes is that there's kind of inconsistent literature on this. You know, we look at, you know, case studies, for example, we look at one wildfire and we look at an exposed population, and maybe in that particular study, we did see, um, you know, outcomes related to strokes and heart attacks, but then in another study, we didn't see it. And so there's, there's discrepancy right now. Potentially that's due to the fact that there's so much heterogeneity in the exposed, um, in the smoke that's exposing folks, but we don't actually know, but it's something just kind of to know that's out there is that we're seeing system-wide inflammation and therefore um, the health impacts are myriad. Um, when you look at sort of the occupational uh, risks of this, we see that folks who are wildland firefighters for multiple years have higher rates of hypertension. So again, kind of going down to that oxidative stress endothelial cell dysfunction pathway. And also we're seeing that they have higher rates of oxidative stress and that those rates of oxidative stress are associated with an increased arterial stiffness, right? So again, we're, we can observe these, these sequential changes happening um, at a small level among wildland firefighters, which we can only extrapolate to that 
this is actually affecting the larger population in potentially similar ways. Um, we are also have some studies out there that are looking at just all cause mortality, right? When there's a wildfire, you know, people have discrete impacts on their respiratory system, on their cardiovascular system, but there's a lot of other factors that can cause people to be injured or killed during wildfires um, related to direct exposure to wildfires, but then also the downstream sequelae of that. And so we definitely have evidence showing, you know, wildfires obviously are causing widespread health impacts. So one thing that I would say is a, is a gap in literature right now is that we're really lacking studies to understand what the cumulative risks are, right? All of us, you know, I live in the West, right? And we're exposed to this season after season, right? And what is the impact on our health of living here and how can we protect ourselves? And I think that's kind of the, the million dollar question here. We have a couple studies looking at sort of long-term data. So there was a huge wildfire in Indonesia in 1997, and researchers interviewed folks 10 years after the wildfire. And what they found is that many people had lower lung capacity. They generally reported um, lower like wellness and health, and they were they self-reported lower um, physical functioning than kind of you know matched um, participants who were not exposed to these wildfires. And so um, what the pathways are to get there pathophysiologically, we don't necessarily know, but we do know that these wildfire events um, can have long-term impacts on our physical health as well as mental health. There's been some emerging literature really looking at the impacts on, um, on pregnant women and on unborn children. And so what we're seeing here is that um, women who are exposed to wildfire smoke exposure when they're pregnant um, are, are at risk of having um, preterm birth, are at risk of having um, small for gestational age babies and other types of, uh, of health outcomes and pregnancy outcomes associated with exposure to wildfire smoke, which is, which is not super surprising given what we know about the pathophysiology there. And again, this is, you know, these are often isolated studies. We don't have large um, national databases to study this, but, um, you know, I think we have a precautionary principle to kind of operate on here where we know that pregnant women are a highly vulnerable population that we need to be doing things to protect um, when we have wildfires. There's also been some emerging literature really looking at mental health, right? Um, among uh, wildland firefighters, um, the rates of PTSD are somewhere around 10 to 20%. Um, also, you know, firefighters have really high risks of depression, of insomnia. Um, we don't really know what the general, how the general public is responding to this. We just haven't really studied this. Um, but there are huge mental health impacts, especially when we're thinking about vulnerable populations being affected, having their houses burned down, having their possessions lost, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the downturn sequelae of how that affects the social fabric of a community and, and their ability to rebuild. Um, I kind of started talking a little bit um, in this about COVID, um, but I'm going to come back to it here because we know that um, air quality and respiratory pathogens have um, synergistic effects in terms of how they can potentiate disease in humans. And so um, this study here um, from Environmental International was looking at um, wildfire PM 2.5 exposure and they found that it was associated with an increased rate of, of influenza that was um, causing disease enough to make people present to medical attention, right? And so I think that makes sense when we kind of look back at the pathophysiology of, of wildfire smoke exposure is that it's causing, uh, you know, uh, inflammation in the lungs and, you know, making us more vulnerable to potential respiratory infections. There's also been large studies looking at COVID-19 and air pollution, and we know that living in cities where there is high levels of air pollution um, puts you at higher risk of COVID-19 mortality. So those are the those are like the the health impacts. But then you know what happens um, to health systems, right? What happens to our hospitals as as we are as humans in the community are experiencing these health impacts? Well, there's consistent evidence showing that there are regional surges in healthcare utilization and expenditures. We know there's tons of increased emergency room visits, increased hospitalizations, and increased physician visits, right? And so this is something that we need to be aware of as we're thinking about health system planning, especially in areas of the country that we know are wildfire prone. 
So we did a study, um, this was back in 2018, and we were looking at the association between wildfire related particulate matter and ICU admissions, because we felt like ICUs are, uh, are really a limited resource at a lot of hospitals. And so we were trying to say, you know, can we build a model to look at, you know, if we were to expose, you know, the Denver, the greater Denver region to a smoke plume of this size, what would be the predicted increase in need among ICUs, because having that type of model would allow health systems to be able to pre-position resources and potentially prepare for things like this. And so basically to quantify this impact, we investigated the association between wildfire related PM 2.5 at a hospital zip code, and then ICU admissions at that hospital. And then we use models to predict the utilization surges associated with a hypothetical week long smoke episode. And so we used data sets that were kind of covering large geographic areas. We looked at a 20, uh, roughly a, a 10 year time frame, and we tried to sort of figure out what that relationship might be. And so interestingly, um, what we found is that for every um, 10 uh, microgram per meter squared increase in PM 2.5, we see an increase in ICU admissions, but it doesn't happen really on average until day five. Um, when we broke this out by specific age groups, we found that, okay, well, you know, on average, we don't see surges in ICUs till day five, but in the short term, we see um, that pediatric patients actually present on day one or two, and that the older populations aren't presenting till day five. And so we theorized we didn't do any analysis of exactly what medical causes were driving these ICU admissions. But we basically theorize that, you know, kids are going to have more respiratory um, effects from PM 2.5 exposure. So all the asthma kids are kind of coming in right away, whereas perhaps the more delayed effects on the elderly population related to cerebrovascular, cardiovascular events, you know, if those are mediated by oxidative stress and inflammation, that those could take several days to develop and eventually for people to decide that they're going to come to the emergency room for their chest pain. Um, so when we're thinking kind of about, you know, health system preparedness um, related to climate change and related to wildfire exposures, you know, we, we've got to sort of, I think, think about this in, in many different ways in terms of how we can be, be prepared. Um, so, you know, one thing that comes to comes to mind is thinking about, um, you know, a regional scope and cooperative agreements. So in Colorado, for example, there's really like one, one and a half children's hospitals, right? And so if you were to have a really large wildfire smoke exposure in Colorado, and we know that day one, pediatric ICU admissions are going to go skyrocket, um, you know, how can we work within our regions to be able to buffer these impacts to make sure that people get care? Um, so that sort of gives way to thinking about, you know, are there early warning systems that can be developed so that health systems can be prepared for these types of events? And then how can we identify potentially vulnerable populations um, so we can provide adequate public health messaging to try to help keep them safe? In terms of what our role is in this, and as, as clinicians, as health providers, as people who interact with patients, you know, I think there's many different ways that we can address this. First of all, we have to think about preparedness, right? We have to ensure that patients who have chronic respiratory disease have access to respiratory medications, right? Or that they have refills on their prescriptions so that they're able to, to manage their symptoms um, potentially without having to seek medical attention, right? We have to educate our patients, right? We have to let them know um, that they can check the air quality on the Air Now app and that we're coming into wildfire season. And, you know, do you have a plan? Do you know that because you have asthma or COPD that you're going to be vulnerable to this? And so, you know, you got to look out for these signs and symptoms, right? Um, you know, we can recommend that caregivers um, of the elderly, caregivers of young children, maybe keep their their loved ones inside, although now that I've heard Luke's talk, I'm not sure if that's the best recommendation, um, inside with an air filter and a well-sealed building um, during uh, wildfire events. Um, and then we can also educate caregivers on, you know, how can we eliminate other triggers, right? How can we take smoke, you know, tobacco smoke out of homes, et cetera, et cetera? And how do we create a healthy indoor air environment? And then, you know, I would say the kind of last step of this is like thinking about how to involve our larger care networks in creating healthy environments at home for patients, thinking about how do we engage social workers? How can we provide access to air quality, um, sorry, to air filters to our super vulnerable populations who we think are going to be affected?
Um, so these are just a little bit of food for thought in terms of how I am thinking about, you know, how we can act as clinicians, how we can sort of counsel our patients from the emergency department, and how we can really um, improve our health systems to be able to respond to these events, which we know are going to become more common as time goes by. So thank you all so much. I'll stop there and I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Outstanding talk. Uh, super informative. I'm just going to ask a quick follow-up question for Cecilia, then we'll open uh, questions to the general audience. If you've got a question you want to ask yourself, please just raise your hand and I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, Stephanie has collected a few questions and we can draw from those as well. Um, so Cecilia, I, you, you did an awesome job answering most of my questions I had going into the talk. I'm wondering um, the, if there are any studies looking at pulmonary function tests of people with those repeated short-term exposures to wildfire smoke. Um, you know, we have this thing called the Boise Trails Challenge here. Uh, where you mountain bike or run or hike uh, most of the foothills trails. And last summer, it was just terrible. And I remember every day going out for a ride, feeling worse and worse. Um, and then, you know, kind of feeling like it lagged for weeks after that. Um, but I don't know if that is a, a real reflection of, of what my lungs were doing, or if there's been any studies that show kind of how long those effects to your lung function last. That's a really interesting question. Um, so there's, there's been studies looking at wildland firefighters. They're kind of like, you know, it, it's important to do because they're an, it's an occupational risk, but also because you can more easily control, you know, what is the exposure, right? You can say, okay, this, this wildland firefighter was, you know, within 10 miles of, of this type of wildfire for this period of time, right? So, so you have a little bit more control over what the exposure is versus, you know, you on your mountain bike or me on my mountain bike, you know, who knows what we're being exposed to, right? And when you study those wildland firefighters, what you see is that even across one shift, even across one day, their lung function, their FEV1 decreases. And it decreases across a day and that decreases across a season. But then it's interesting. So in the off season, um, we see that their lung function kind of rebounds a little bit, right? Um, but then they go back into another season, their lung function declines. And so the question is, you know, in this rebound, are your lungs making 100% recovery? Are they repairing 100% of the damage which was done? I would, I would fathom that probably not, right? And, um, you know, when we have uh, inflammation, when we have oxidative injury, what that gives rise to is fibrosis, right? And so, you know, we don't know that for certain. We're not doing lung biopsies on these folks, um, but I, I would think that there is going to be some, some cumulative damage, although I don't think we've completely worked it out yet. I'm just curious uh, to follow up with that. You know, it seems like wildland firefighters are sort of the uh, modern day coal miners. Um, and I wonder if we're doing anything to take care of them both uh, in the short term with uh, proper PPE and in the long term with, um, you know, something like we just saw with the um, uh, military uh, bill that got passed about um, the burning uh, uh, in the war zones um, you know, that John Stewart was really involved in. I'm, I'm curious if there's anything like that for, for wildland firefighters. There's a lot of money going to study this right now. Um, from what I've gleaned from talking to folks in this industry is like, you know, what's the best way to protect yourself? Well, wear an N95. But when you are, uh, you know, out in burning hot weather, trying to fight a fire and you have a mask on your face, like it's, it, it's just incompatible with doing the job well. And so, although that would be sort of the, maybe the best thing you could do in, in the short term to kind of protect your lungs, um, going out and trying to fight a wildfire with a mask on your face um, is, is not really an acceptable solution for a lot of wildfires, wildland firefighters. So um, I don't think we have a, a solution for that yet, you know? If I can, if I can jump in on this, this is an area that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, and I would, I would say that we are at a major turning point in the way we think about and study wildland firefighters. And I say that because the definition of a wildland firefighter and their role that they play as a government employee just recently changed. Um, under the Biden administration's new infrastructure bill, there was some wording in there that changes the way we uh, think about wildland firefighters as being a seasonal worker versus a permanent worker. And they've always been seasonal and they've never really 
been called a firefighter consistently. Um, one of the things that I found in trying to study wildland firefighters is people fight fire who aren't called a firefighter in their, in their name. Um, and so because of those reasons, we've not studied and protected that particular type of, um, uh, of government employee the way that we do, for example, people who are on a submarine and are exposed to nuclear um, exposures. They wear, uh, uh, they wear specialized monitors and have yearly physicals, if not twice a year physicals. We're studying their long-term health. We've never done that for firefighters. And I think it's particularly, or it's, it's, it's at least in part because of their uh, previous um, seasonal aspect. Now they're permanent. Now that changes the liability for the US government and uh, I think that's going to be the impetus now for a more, um, uh, a, a better strategy for studying the long-term health of wildland firefighters. And I hope to take a huge part in this moving forward. That's great. And that kind of feeds into another question that we got is that this is, these have been great discussions and great data. Um, how does equity uh, is impacted? Are we seeing certain groups being affected uh, more so than others? And I think that was, that was a great discussion on the, uh, the firefighter people in the field. Uh, and what about the communities that would be impacted or employees? Well, I, I think, you know, Luke probably have a ton to say about this, but, you know, you're seeing variability in terms of indoor air quality among, you know, skilled nursing facilities. I mean, I think the same exists, you know, in the community, right? If you have a really, let's say expensive, well-built house where you can close the window and seal it off and you've gotten a great HVAC system that has a HEPA filter built in, you're going to do a lot better than if you're in a, you know, a public housing apartment building that was built in the 1950s um, that has a terrible HVAC system and, you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so you know, you, the resources available to an individual to be able to protect themselves from air quality is incredibly variable. And so, you know, yeah, I, I, you know, I think that there are vulnerable pockets um, everywhere, right, with in terms of people who have education to understand what the impacts are, but additionally, the resources to be able to protect themselves. Um, you know, one thing I would really love to see is, is you know, insurance companies being able to cover um, these types of, you know, for example, um, upgrades to, to housing facilities, as well as access to high quality air filters for particularly vulnerable patients. I would say one group that is oftentimes overlooked and I and I, even discussing their exposure can sometimes be a hot button issue it, it is the homeless. Um, and so that goes for people who are actually living in the outdoor environment and being exposed, especially across the Northwest region, areas like Portland uh, or even uh, there in Boise. Um, and also when the homeless go into homeless shelters uh, in Boise, uh, we, re we recently had a very hot button uh, conversation around where to house uh, a number of homeless folks. And there was a building that was proposed that became a problem in the community because of, you know, people not wanting those folks in their community, that kind of thing. Um, and what, one of the things that I wanted to bring up was, you know, can we work with that, those folks who are organizing the homeless shelter to enhance the air quality for those folks? And I got pushback from that because one of the things that people say is of all of the problems that the homeless community has to deal with, air quality is fairly low on their priority list. We're talking about, you know, uh, dealing with mental illness. We're talking about dealing with drug and alcohol addiction. You know, air quality is pretty low. At the same time, though, to ask the question a different way is among all of the problems that the homeless have to deal with, do they also have to deal with air pollution? And I think the answer should be no, but I don't have a really good way of solving that. So I think we have some major challenges ahead of us when we think about vulnerable populations. Um, and that's just one example that I wanted to bring up. Outstanding. Um, I, I really wanna thank both of our speakers for uh, over time. And I really appreciate you guys uh, joining us and talking about this very important and unfortunately expanding issue uh, that affects us here in the Northwest. Um, Dr. Luke Montrose, Dr. Cecilia Sorensen, thank you so much for your wonderful presentations. Um, and thanks again to our partners at uh, St. Luke's Sustainability Program. If you wanna learn more about the work we're doing, um, it's idahocliniciansforclimateandhealth.org, or you can email us at sustainability at slhs.org.
Thank you so much for an outstanding discussion. I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.